Well, um, first of all, no one has ever rebutted the studies that I cited, uh, not anyone. Um, the, only, the only report that's actually been taken on by some of the scholars um, is Rick's, as I said. Um, and again, some of those same scholars are the ones who basically said the database isn't good enough um, and then tried to prevent him from getting access to the California database. Uh, and as I said, that really speaks volumes. Um, and sure, there are plenty of people um, who have benefited in some way. I don't know whether any of the people that you listed are among them because I don't know what the counterfactual is. Uh, I suspect uh, that you and Randall would have been very successful even without preferences, assuming that you got preferences, and I don't know that. One interesting thing is that there's one bit of evidence um, Wait, from Wait, let me just stop you. In 1950, these guys would have done as well as, as they have done in 1980, 1990, 2000? Is that if there weren't racial preferences in, any, in their lives? They claim to be, be uh, the beneficiaries of racial preferences. If that's so, um, it but, may but well be that, that they, they would have, be. I think, I just want to clarify, you were saying in the absence of racial preferences that they would have done as well. I just, okay. Yeah, they may have. Ted Shaw. Well, a couple of things. One, um, uh, Gail, I, it's a wonderful thing if nobody's ever rebutted you. That seems to me to be different from what my experience in academia is generally with studies, but I'll check it out. Um, Not everybody more importantly, me, but the studies. The studies. More, I, got, I have you. Uh, more importantly, though, uh, to be clear, uh, I didn't claim to be the beneficiary of preferences. That's a loaded term. Use that term, the debate is over. Uh, I claim to be a beneficiary of affirmative action, and I restate that. I am, unapologetically. The light of opportunity did not shine in neighborhoods like the one I came from, in areas like the area I came from, until people consciously took action to do it. It didn't happen serendipitously. And it doesn't mean that I or people like me are not qualified. So uh, I, I appreciate you saying I would have made it anyway. Um, I don't, I don't accept that. I mean, I like to think that maybe it was true, but the fact is that what that does is obscure the structural inequality that has existed in our country and has built into our country. And, and we still have not um, ridded ourselves, or rid ourselves, excuse me, of that structural inequality. Rick Sander, do you want to respond or would you like to move to another question? Well, I would just say, um, if you look at the debate on law school mismatch, which, is, as Gail says, is, has been the most contested one, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I published my initial study. The data was limited. My analytical abilities were probably limited. There were about 20 critical studies published in response. But none of these were published in peer-reviewed journals. A debate was joined. New articles came out. If you look at the sort of where the dust has settled eight years later, there are now four peer-reviewed studies that have been published that all find strong evidence of law school mismatch. They all find roughly the, the, the disparity in chances caused by large preferences that, uh, that I mentioned before. There have been zero studies, zero peer-reviewed studies published on the other side. And the most recent critique was actually withdrawn when the author admitted that her, her results could not be replicated. So if you look closely at this, um, you, you see a pretty overwhelming pattern.